Hey folks, welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. This is the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to help spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. I want to ha- introduce myself so that you know who you're listening to or watching. Uh, my name is Corey Johnston. I'm a laborer in rural Saskatchewan in Canada. I grew up between a family farm and a small community of about 10,000 people, and I eventually moved to a small city of about 230,000 people. Most of the people here are conservative and right-wing with many that would be considered far right. I'm different from that. I'm an anarcho-communist, an atheist, and a skeptic. This means that I try to follow ideas that are better for everyone, uh, but I also try to base those ideas on the best evidence available. As an anarchist, I believe that all people are equal and deserve to be treated as such. Uh, No one is above another, and systems that put people above each other in value are not systems that I can endorse. When you hear anarchists talk about hierarchy, this is what they mean. As a communist, I believe that everyone is entitled to a good life and all things belong to all. There is nuance to this, but above all, it entitles everyone to a safe and good life free from coercion. As an atheist, I am agnostic. It's not just that I don't believe in any god or gods, but I also believe that the claims people make about the god or gods they believe in are inconsistent and often incoherent. My anarchist tendencies mean I try not to judge others for believing things that aren't true or evidence-based, but with my mix of tendencies, I do also try to help people reach the best ideas and come to the best conclusions for everyone, rather than just supporting the status quo or being purely self-interested. I've been podcasting for almost 10 years now. I started with the atheist and skeptic communities in 2013, though I eventually moved on to more progressive communities and spaces as the toxicity and reactionary tendencies in skeptic spaces became more apparent. I do believe that a good skeptic will land on libertarian or anarchist ideals, but nobody who follows the evidence can say that capitalism is good for the world or humanity. I've only been working with video for a couple of years, and I hope that my channel can grow and build a community like some of those I've seen around other channels. However, I don't live online. I have children, a partner, a job that is demanding, and an aging parent who sometimes needs my help. This means my schedule for production is inconsistent. I hope that you will bear with me and that you enjoy my work. I have many ways that you can support this channel, and I always have other projects on the go. So look in the show notes or description box to check those out as well. My Patreon is patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, and I deeply appreciate any support you can send my way. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me through any social media platform or by email at mindofaskepticalleftist at (laughs) gmail.com. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm talking to Lake from The Revolutionary's Garden. (laughs) Thanks for joining me. I'm glad to be here. (laughs) So I guess a good place to start is kind of just a little bit about yourself. Yeah. What what brought you here? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So uh, I'm a Marxist organizer in rural Maine. Uh, I run... The Facebook page, The Revolutionary's Garden, and the podcast, The Revolutionary's Garden. I'm currently working on building a communal farm on the coast of Maine. We just got 60 acres of farmland that we're building up. Um, and it's going Fantastic. To, yeah, we're going to focus largely on community food networking in the area and promote like cooperative farming in the area. Just because in the rural perspective, farming is a huge part of just not only surviving and, and making money and making a living, but also just it's a huge part of the community out there. And so really the way we are choosing to organize is through food, through farming, through networking, cooperative farms, instead of going for this really idealistic small family farm model that doesn't actually work uh, right. in any way, shape or form. Um, yeah, uh, I guess, you know, that's really cool. Yeah. I, how did how did you start? Uh, like uh, organizing a farm? Uh, so I, my first job ever was on a farm and I actually worked for an anarchist, crunchy granola farmer guy who had no job aside from his farm and grew most of his own food and was like networked with all these other gro- uh, homesteading type anarchists. So that was my first taste of farming and agriculture was working for this guy. Uh, and I left farming. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Like the pretty good <laughs> first exposure. Uh, yeah. Farming has a rep for being a very conservative, very yeah. not great uh, uh, culture and community. But I think when you get into the small farmers, uh, like I was at a farming. This is a slight aside, but I was at a farming roundtable a while ago, and somebody said, "Well, we can all agree that the real problem facing farming right now is capitalism." 
And everyone around the table just, yeah, yeah. And, and we moved on. And I'm, I'm sitting there just stunned that, you know, this 50-year-old yeah, yeah. white guy with a hog farm was just like, yeah, capitalism's pretty bad. And they just So what do we do about that? Come yeah, on, guys. Like, no, no, let's go back. Go back. Uh, but yeah. And I eventually went back to farming after a big, long career. Like I worked on the Peace Project in Ireland for a while as an editor for a while. Uh, and it all made me intensely miserable. And I realized all I wanted to do was farm. And after being back in farming for a while and trying to be, you know, the solo farmer, you know, I, I do everything myself. I raise my own animals. I grow my own food. And it's awful. And the whole system is just <laughs> made to not let you do that. Like, I yeah, still had to have right. a day job. I still had to have a partner who helped me out. And just being an individualist single family farm is not possible. Uh, yeah. And so, so much of that comes back to cooperative farming and communal farming, you know. If a bunch of small farms get together, they can exchange, like one person can grow mainly veggies and one person can raise pigs and one person can raise cows. And uh, one person can't afford a really nice tractor, but 10 farms together can buy a really nice tractor and just share it around because you only yeah. need a tractor like a couple a couple of days a month at most for most that's farms. right there's really no reason to own it all by yourself <laughs> yeah uh and that that principle can just be applied to so many aspects of farming like co cooperative farming is just so much easier and so much more successful on top of being a perfect route towards more socialist anarchist communist modes right. of production like that's kind of the whole point is cooperative <laughs> we're like working cooperatively that's that's yeah. the gist uh, and so moving back here to Maine, uh, I've been working together with my family and with a couple of comrades in, that I already had in the area that were farming. And we pooled all of our resources to buy this parcel of land and buying land. I won't, I don't want to say buying land is the be all end all just because there's right. the whole buying stolen land aspect of it. You know, like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not buying land. I'm purchasing bloody land taken from the Sagadahawk and the Kennebec and the Abenaki. Right, right. But like on top of that, you know, just you can, there are many ways to farm without owning land. Just for us, May, uh, farmland in Maine is so cheap. It just was the best decision. Okay. But even so, we still have someone among us who's a tech worker who can pretend to have income. And one of us actually liquidated their 401k in order to buy this farmland for all of us to farm wow. equally. So like, it's really hard. Like even with yeah. eight people pooling all of their money and all of their resources, we just barely got a parcel of land that we can farm. Um, but we're going to be moving yeah, there. That's... Yeah. Yeah. But we're going to be moving there <laughs> next month and we've already started breaking ground and doing stuff. And basically it's just going to be a little bit of a commune type situation. Like six of us are going to live in the main house, but we're also building uh, supplementary housing around just so that people can come and stay and work on the farm and develop cooperative, the cooperative farm there and networking with farms, you know, in the area. Cause there's three farms right across the street from the farm we just bought that we're going to be working okay. with. Yeah. Wow. That, that's amazing. <laughs> Sorry. That was a lot. Just, <laughs> no, that's, yeah. that's amazing. Like that's, uh, I want to live there. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, and that, that's mainly the thing is every time I bring it up, I'm like, yeah, we'd love to have cabins or a cottage or even hell, even a trailer or a tent uh, that people could just stay with and work on the land if they need a break, if they need somewhere to stay. And everyone I've talked to has loved the idea and wanted to be part of that. So like, if everybody yeah. loves this idea and wants it to happen, then let's make it happen. You know, that was the, sure. kind of the impetus. Like, well, then let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So I guess, Moving on from the farm uh, <laughs> to the podcast. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what uh, what uh, what got you started doing the show, like uh, the revolutionary? Uh, so Garden. it was an idea. Yeah. So it was an idea I had a while ago. I want to say maybe three years ago, uh, especially towards like the start of the pandemic, where you had people buying seeds and trying to grow their own food. Um, and it was originally going to be in cooperation with Crow, uh, but that fell through. And so I eventually, I'm like, okay. If I've been having this idea cooking in my brain for years, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And I kind of said, I'm, okay, this is when I'm going to start it. Two months from now, even though I had no episodes recorded, I had nothing written. I'm like, well, the pressure's on, so now I have to do it. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of what I find with food security resources and even left-wing podcasts in general is people love talking about theories and ideas and history. Yeah. And that's all 
don't get me wrong. That's all incredibly important stuff. And I listen right. to those podcasts and I enjoy all that. And so many, so many people are asking themselves, well, what do I actually do? Like, okay, right. yes, socialism's good. Yes, I think we should organize. How do I organize? Like, where do I where go? Do we, yeah, <laughs> where do we go from there? And so the Revolutionary's Garden was meant to be sort of a toolbox of, yeah, here's actual step-by-step -step instructions on how to do a thing. And that thing is growing, preserving, and distributing food, just because that's what I know. You know, I... I'm not going to make a podcast about something I know nothing about, but I, I grew up in a food culture, you know, canning and drying, and I've devoted so much of my life to farming and learning about how to grow, learning how to grow food and raise animals. Right. So that just seemed like the logical thing for me to do. Uh, and so each episode is largely very uh, to a single point. Um, I actually try to make the episode topics as uh, specific as possible. So they just say peas. Or right, pumpkin. yeah, I just listened to <laughs> carrots the other day. Yeah, like I, I, it's a little joke of mine just to try to make the title as simple as possible, but also like the episode. If you listen to an episode episode about, like you said, carrots, I'm going to talk to you about you know a little bit about the history of carrots and and some of the nutrition, just because I think that's important and fun. But the bulk of the episode is this is how you pick a variety of carrot. This is how you grow it. This is how you preserve it. That's it. Like to yeah. the point step-by-step -step resources. I want someone to listen to one of these episodes and be able to go out and grow and process and harvest a carrot. And, right. and that's the point. Uh, and like, there's the food preservation series, which has like making cheese and butter or uh, making country wine. Um, all of it's really just meant to be, like I said, an audio toolbox that you can listen to, go out and do the thing. And because I think that's just the kind of resource that's lacking on the left sometimes is just how to do the thing from a community perspective specifically. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Like that, that is one of the things like, uh, I'm an anarchist. I, uh, I've been looking for other anarchists within my area. And I think I found like three other guys, <laughs> 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 but, but, uh, we're still like, I live in Saskatchewan. It's a very mm -hmm. rural, uh, area. Yeah. So it is a lot of conservatism and, and, yeah. uh, stuff like that. So it, it may be, uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Organizing yeah. in rural areas is its whole <laughs> other <laughs> bag of beans. You know, I'm organizing in Maine, which is a very rural area. I think yeah. it has one of two front frontier counties east of the Mississippi. Um, and there are definitely unique challenges with trying to organize in a rural area. And I think personally, I think farming and gardening is a good way to go about that in some instances, just because, Rural people take real a lot of pride in their gardens and their farms. For sure, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I remember, like, I grew up on a farm, so uh, my my grandparents lived in the same yard as us, like the mm -hmm. same home quarter. Yeah, and uh, and the the garden that we had was just massive, and my mm -hmm. my grandmother was in there all day, every day, taking care of it herself. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Utah Phillips has a great quote about. Uh, you not being able to find the line between heavy gardening and light farming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, like uh, for your communal farm there, like, mm -hmm. is it, are you going to be going into like, uh, like grain crops and like uh, larger crop fields or is it mostly going to be food uh, gardens? Yeah. So that's, that's been an ongoing discussion actually. <laughs> okay. uh, so from where we stand currently, we're going to focus largely on vegetables and herbs and some animal livestock and then integrating that into the forest landscape. Because like the property we bought, only about 10 acres of it is field and okay. the rest is just forest going back to a, a, a small pond and brook in the back. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to incorporate a food system into what's already there rather than trying right. to start everything from scratch. And I have experience growing grains and... As I've said, and I've uh, like in these planning meetings, and what we're discussing, I've said, if we find a farm down the road who grows grains and has all the milling equipment and the combines and the harvesters, then yeah, we'll grow some grain because we can work with them and borrow equipment and trade. Sure. If nobody nearby has that, you know, just buying the, yeah, the combine right. alone, you're talking about a half million dollar purchase. Exactly. Yeah. Um, that's too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I think if we're talking about a decentralized, robust food system, grains play a much smaller role than they do yeah. in our current food system. Like, don't get me wrong. I love grains. I love bread. I'm always going to 
grow some like in my cover crops. And I'm probably at some point I want to harvest some of those cover crops and grind my own grain, you know, with a little mortar and pestle and, <laughs> and make nice. my own loaf of bread. But that's going to be a special treat kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. Uh, I definitely think there's a place in cooperative farming and in a better, you know, post-revolution food system for grains and cereals because, yeah, they're like being able to just take a two, a, a 10, 50 acres and make a thousands of tons of shelf stable high protein high calorie food stuff is a good thing it's pretty like, good thing like, yeah <laughs> like there's a reason we grow a lot of grain it's it's shelf stable it can be transported around really easily and made into a really delicious food product um yeah but i think for a bunch of ragtag poor proles trying to farm <laughs> in rural right. maine like maybe that's not the route we want to go like yep no let, that's I'll, fair i'll let our midwestern comrades uh, collectivize and take over the local grain farms owned by the big corporations and let them handle that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's something that like uh, around here, we kind of, uh, it's all turned into big com company yeah. farms, right? Yeah. Like, so yeah, it, instead of the, it used to be the small family farms or like a couple family farms together kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But now it's all these big company farms yeah. and it would be great to see some people like expropriate <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so but it's a it's a long stretch I, uh, from that i think yeah we're we're a little ways out <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the meantime we gotta you know for us it's gonna be farming what land we have we can get our grubby little hands on and producing what food we can and sharing it with who we can yeah yeah no i live in a I live in a city now uh mm -hmm. well i guess a city by my standards <laughs> city <laughs> Yeah, according according to people who live in like Calgary and stuff, Regina is not actually that big. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so I've been thinking about like getting in touch with community gardens and stuff too, like because mm -hmm. I know there's some around. That, yeah, and uh, one of the people that I know is actually working for uh, with presenting to the city council, trying to get it so that people can have chickens in their yards mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah. Which is app apparently currently against the law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, it, and I, I will say in general, I'm against electoralism. I don't think yeah. it's a successful route <laughs> for anything. I think it can be a tool that you treat with extreme care and distrust, like, yeah. like a chainsaw that's not running right. You know, like you'll use it if you got to, but be wary. <laughs> um, it can backfire pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> With that said, Maine recently passed a food security law, which okay. basically the point of the law is to prohibit any town or county from passing a law that in inhibits personal food security. So basically with this law in place, someone could sue a town that had a law that said no chickens and say, mm -hmm. it's my right to provide food for myself, so I should be allowed to have chickens. And it would overturn the town's law. I will say law like that law is generally good. And I think it's helpful. Like, it's so like if anybody is going to pursue an electoral route, maybe that's the kind of thing you go for rather than just voting for a politician you think might take pity mm. on you every now and again. Um, but I will say the law even specifically says that it protects private property above all ounce. Like, right. it only, like you can of produce course. food if you have private property. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't just build it on like a, a piece of land. Nobody's using. Yeah. Yeah, if it belongs very, to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, not, not only does it not say you can, it explicitly says you cannot. Like, yeah. So, and so there, you know, go, you also see a shortcoming with electoralism. Even when you get a concession, it's still rooted in private property. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean that that's kind of the problem I find with like uh, mainstream environmental groups mm -hmm. is that they are often very tied to like nonprofit status yeah. and like electoralism and mm -hmm. like they want to be on the favor of both or all the political parties yeah. so they can't be partisan and it's like okay but how much can we actually do that way it's yeah yeah if we just get the in in the states if we just get the republicans and democrats to agree on something that's good right even though historically <laughs> the few times republicans and democrats agree it's usually the worst thing that's ever happened yeah it's like when you want to go to war that's yeah. when they, <laughs> they agree yeah yeah military spending is agreed upon by both parties oh yeah yeah that we always got more money for that <laughs> yeah no it's uh I often like I've talked to a few guys actually that uh, have 
everybody wants to be able to have a set up like a farm, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's one of these things that it would be just a great thing to be able to do to just go and live kind of sustainably mm -hmm. away from like the where you can build like a community the way you want yeah. a community to be built. Yeah. On like communal structures and stuff mm -hmm. like and actually caring for each other. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, maybe not have the crushing weight of individualist capitalism <laughs> on your back every single day. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I guess it's, it's tough because you still have to be interact with the system yeah. as, as they are. Right. Yeah. Cause like we're getting a mortgage to pay for this land. So like, right. we're still going to have to go out and work. We're still going to have to go out and uh, g attain money to give to banks in order yeah. to exist. But <laughs> Um, we're really hoping it can be a source of relief for people. Like once we get extra housing built and people can just come stay there and exist and just, Hey, help us out in the garden and you're good to go for the rest of the day, you know? Um, but also as a model for trying to survive while building something better. Uh, Cause like this is meant to be, Hey, maybe this can be a similar system to what we hope to build after the revolution, but now, and we can try to work on, working as a community and producing food as a community, even if we still have to go to the, you know, Sam's club to stock up on toilet paper every other week and stuff like that. <laughs> right. Like right. We're, we're still stuck in capitalism. We're still fighting capitalism, but maybe we can eke out a little notch that is inherently revolutionary, both in the way you live and in what you're trying to do. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, maybe it's just uh, wishful thinking, but I tend to think that if people are seeing that and can experience that, then they might be, they're more likely to become radicalized themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like this project is unabashedly communist, you know, we're not hiding the <laughs> fact that this is a communal farm with people living right. together and going together on the land. You know, I'm not sure we're going to be flying a hammer and sickle above the, <laughs> the farm or anything, but, but that would be fantastic. <laughs> It's a thought. Uh, maybe later. Uh, maybe just a red flag. That's a little more. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, you know, I, as someone who's been a communist in farming circles for many years, I've never made it a secret. Uh, right. My last farm was literally called Praxis Farms. Nice. And the logo was a hand holding a sickle, uh, carving up some grain. And it said, uh, the logo was to each what, um, it's the, the, ah, the French philosopher's quote that's attributed to Karl Marx. Um, I can't believe my brain is uh, from, from each according to ability to each. Yeah. According to <laughs> yeah. That was on my farm logo and people bought it like, like middle-class, like everybody still bought stuff from my farm and they still worked for me as a farmer, even recognizing that I was, yeah, a diehard commie. Right. Um, and I think there's something to be said for normalizing those kinds of systems and showing that those kinds of systems can work. Like, yeah, Ideally, sure. this cooperative farm will succeed because working together, we can save money and resources and help each other out. And that will make for a successful farm and a successful living situation that will show both rural podunk Maine that lives around us and, in, you know, friends on Facebook and people around the country that like, hey, this kind of yeah. system actually can work and it's really sustainable and you can do good things with it. But aren't you concerned about owning stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously, we own we own land, so we're bad commies. You know, we're yeah, yeah. No, that's <laughs> we sell products. That's capitalism. Selling uh, things is capitalism. <laughs> if you're not actively starving to death, you're yeah. you're a bad commie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, you always get those kinds of people, but those are never the people you're going to win over yeah. just by being being who you are those are the kinds of people who either go with it because they have to or they're never going to go with it in which case they're probably diehard fascists and i'm not interested in working with them right yeah that's right it's uh, in saskatchewan like we actually had like kind of lefty roots uh, mm -hmm. decades and decades ago and i often wonder like if i could uh, if we could have communal farms on some level like we still have community pastures yeah. so really yeah, like they still are around, like ver various uh, municipalities still have community pastures that uh, farmers have to figure out the schedule and how to get used <laughs> yeah. together. And and uh, so I think that there's a lot of the, the fundamentals are still here. And it's just a matter of like making people aware that yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. 
Yeah, because like even in New England, all over the place, there are still granges, which are these big, white, iconic community buildings where people have dances and spaghetti dinners right. and the Boy Scouts go to meet. And every, I, you know, I'm a little obnoxious every time I see one with somebody who hasn't been with me past one before. I'm like, oh, that's the Grange. You know who built that? The socialists, you know, the, <laughs> the early American socialists, the, the turn of the century. They built that as a socialist community center. Isn't that nifty? Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or even like uh, there was a story here not that long ago where a, a community got together and funded the building of a uh, new rink, like a skating rink. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, guys, <laughs> yeah. you know what that's called? <laughs> yeah. How about, how about this, but for everything? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Let's, let's just do that all yeah. the time. Like, this, but, isn't this great? Don't we all, be, we all put into this and now we all get to benefit from this thing we just built as a community. Isn't that, isn't that super? Isn't that awesome. <laughs> yeah. Instead of looking for corporate donors who will just let us use it when they feel like it. Or... <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've definitely found, I, and I find it more among rural people than urban folks. And like, I suppose the only city I've lived in is Seattle. So that might be coloring my, my p- opinion because okay, it's still yeah. with awful middle-class tech people. But <laughs> there's this yearning for community in any rural area. And like people always talk about, oh, things are different now. We used to be a real community. We used to work together. And then they'll espouse an individualist capitalism. I'm like, no guys, like, yeah, you're right. Community is awesome. Let's do that. Like, let's go back to that community aspect. And I think trying to push socialism simply as community working together to help each other out has a lot of ground with with conservative folks. And like in a lot of ways, you can describe socialism in yeah. its entirety, but just avoid the word socialism, <laughs> capitalism, and a few other yeah. like trigger words. And and th- you'll have a lot of conservative, rural, conservative, rural Americans or probably Canadians too, agreeing yep. with everything you're saying because yeah, socialism's rad. <laughs> like it does, yeah. it is a good thing. Uh, and it's just the, the, the propaganda and the fear mongering that, gives people that knee jerk reaction. Yeah. It makes me think of actually talking to my dad. Like, uh, he's a, he's a very uh, Mm anti-communist, anti-socialist type of person. But when we talk about the things that we're valuing, like, they're the same things. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I said, but where do you think I get these values? Like I'm an anarchist because of the values. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> I'm every time you guys talked about community and working together and taking care of the land, I was listening. Like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird that we're on opposite political teams. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. But I guess as much as one is on a team, I, I don't know if I yeah. even, even call myself a team so much. I identify as an anarchist mm-hmm. or an anarchist communist, but uh, yeah. In, in, uh, you know, in the way that I think that that describes my value system. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and, and it's the same thing for me as a Marxist. Like to me, Marxism is just a, a system for analyzing the world around me, studying the development of human society and trying to come up with ideas based on that to change it for the better. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a Marxist because Marx had an awesome beard and said cool things. Cause you're like worshiping at the <laughs> altar of Marx. Yeah. Like oh yeah, everything he said is absolutely true. Uh, it's just, I'm a Marxist because it's a, it's a pool of knowledge and way of thinking about the world that people have built on for decades, you know, and, and some incredible people who did change the world for the better. The, the Sankaras, the Che Guevara's like these incredibly kind people who did good things are Marxists. And, ascribe to that thought process and pool of science not yeah but he said cool thing i everything he says is is law now <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right do you know how many yards of linen does it it takes to make a coat <laughs> <laughs> i do not actually yeah. <laughs> uh but yeah and it's, it's yeah. like reading like uh kropotkin like that's the big anarcho-communist yeah, book right the bread book. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm so I've gone through the the Kropotkin anthology, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm on fields workers and workshops or whatever the third book in the is it's called I can't even remember, and he's going through all these products much mm-hmm. like, like <laughs> and I'm like okay this is I mean, great but yeah 
Like, I get what you're getting at, but like, I don't think you had to be this specific. <laughs> right. Yeah, I got it. I got it. We broad can... strokes, man. Broad yeah. strokes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I sure. think I've tried to read Capital, gosh, three or four times now. Um, and I've got, <laughs> I can say confidently, I have the gist of it, but boy, is that a behemoth. And, and because, you know, oh, he's, yeah. he's writing as a 19th century philosopher, he has to define every single word he's using as he's using it. And it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. It's pretty dry. <laughs> it's, the things we do for theory. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I, there's a podcast. I think it's put out by, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the guy who put it out, but it's like, uh, go, uh, reading capital with comrades. Yes. Yep. And I, so I, I listened to that and I didn't <laughs> read capital. I just listened to them. <laughs> I mean that they cover pretty much everything as far as I could tell. Like you the know, analysis is what I was looking for. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> you don't get to brag that you read Capital, right? But. Yeah, I have Capital on my yeah. bookshelf, but there's no way. <laughs> Mighty paperweight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And and again, like I think reading it is important for for reasons. Like it's good to understand fundamentals and stuff. But there are also modern Marxist and modern socialists of all stripes who have taken this body of theory and applied it to the modern world in very good ways that we can read and absorb. And for, for most people, the, everyone should read some theory. It contains yeah. good things to help you think about the world and especially to help you try to organize. Like if you read a lot of theory and to actually take it in, you'll realize why we don't pursue electoral politics anymore. Right. <laughs> like yeah. that's a problem we've solved a couple of times already. Uh, but for the most part, like, the average person doesn't need to read every Marxist book that's ever been written in no. <laughs> or every and, anarchist book that's ever been written. Yeah. That's the thing I encounter in, in some anarchist groups is like, well, if you haven't read all of these guys, yeah, then opinion. you don't have a good enough basis to yeah. know anything. And I'm like, okay, but isn't anarchism kind of just about not having hierarchy? <laughs> 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 yeah. Like if you do a, do you have a book on how to set up a uh, revolutionary front and actually challenge these, these authorities in power? Book. Like I'll read that book. Like <laughs> yeah. I'll read girl of warfare. I'll read wretched of the earth. Cause like it actually has some good step-by-step -step information for accomplishing these things. Um, yeah, there, that's the stuff. <laughs> yeah. And actually uh, Che Guevara's guerrilla warfare was one of the inspirations for the revolutionaries garden because he had a whole chapter talking about, taking tractors and piglets and seeds from factory farms and giving them to peasant farmers, right. helping them grow the food. And then the revolutionary army would come back and take some of the food that they like. So takes a share of what they had given them and then go back and keep fighting. And like, Oh, that makes my, just my little revolutionary <laughs> heart patter patter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Well, we're at 30 ish minutes. Oh, yeah. So uh, let's do some counter propaganda. All right. <laughs> So we were talking uh, before the show and you said for counter propaganda, you wanted to uh, cover uh, this, I guess, conspiracy theory about <laughs> <laughs> some warehouses that burnt down. Yeah. So in the past six months or so, about 18 where food warehouses and food distribution hubs have burnt down in, in America. And, and it's been shared around in a lot of homesteading groups and prepper groups and conservative circles about this as a big conspiracy theory that someone, someone, depending, <laughs> someone, I was like, I'm trying to find the words here. Like, it depends on who you are, what that someone is like it, the Jewish cabal, the Illuminati, the deep state, uh, someone yeah. is burning down these warehouses to the globalists. The, yeah. <laughs> to the, the global. <laughs> to threaten the American food supply and create instability that they can then take advantage of somehow. Uh, never mind the <laughs> fact that if they're the deep state, they're already benefiting from everything as it's happening. They don't really need instability to benefit. But breaking down into what has happened is maybe eight warehouses have burned down. One got hit by a plane that was in a freak accident and a few had some minor damage. One wasn't even working. Like one was an abandoned factory that burned down. Like there's okay. nothing in it. <laughs> so like, first of all, that like all in all, only six fact, six or seven factories aren't even working anymore. Right. But if you zoom out a little, there are more than 50,000 food distribution <laughs> hubs and warehouses across the United States as a whole. So even if we lost 18 
That's nothing. Even if we lost 180, even if we lost 1,800, that's not actually a sizable percentage of the food net distribution network in the United States. And on the right, it's just fear mongering and all the crazy stuff that the right propaganda machine is always going to do. But I have seen it filter into the left a little. Okay. And, And I think it's something to fight against just because in the left, there's this concept, not not all the time, but not everywhere, but like there's this general concept that capitalism is about to collapse. If we wait long enough, capitalism will collapse and we'll build socialism. And that's not a good way to go about things because we've been, leftists have been saying that for 150 years, like longer. Right, right. Capital, elements <laughs> of capitalism are very fragile. Like there yes. are elements of our food system that are fragile. We saw that with the pandemic and a shipping, a ship Supply getting stuck in the canal. And, yeah. yeah. Like we see how individual elements are fragile and can break down but capitalism as a whole is so vicious it will cut off its own arm to get out of a bear trap like capitalism will do anything to survive so even if a bunch of food warehouses burn down capitalism is going to find a way to keep going unless it's forcibly stopped like they'll requisition food they'll tap into the cheese caves the you know the two million tons of cheese we have hidden in milwaukee like Capitalism will find a way to feed the people it decides it wants to feed. Capitalism is in just such a, that's why capitalism has succeeded and survived as long as it has. It's because it's so vicious. It will destroy anyone and anything to survive. So the idea that it's on the verge of collapse is not a helpful one. Right. Even if we, <laughs> like we still need to push. We still need to build our own systems. We still need to yeah. fight back. Like there's no excuse to just sit around and wait. You got to go for the, like, you got to fight back no matter what. And I think this whole s- conspiracy theory about the food system collapsing is just, it's, it's just propaganda that's not actually amounting to anything. That said, yeah, build food security in your own community. Do, <laughs> like, like, don't get me wrong, build yeah. food security, start a garden if you can, work with your, your community, do all that. But like, don't do it because you think the warehouses are about to burn down. <laughs> like, I, uh, I often think like, in terms of food security, like uh, our basics often will be available under almost any circumstances, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like our extras, this the the chocolate from uh, the fields in Africa yeah. or what have you. Like that's the stuff that we'll end up sacrificing yeah. when supply chains and climate change are 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 yeah. slowing things down. And and I go through this a lot in the Revolutionaries Garden where. Many staples, unless there's a really big collapse or any sort of really big problems, staples are going to be available. Like, yeah. you may lose, a, like, we may not have staples for a few days. Like, you should have a couple weeks worth of food in your house for disaster preparedness. But in general, you're still, you're always going to be able to get bread and potatoes and some canned food. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's never, in the imperial core, that's not likely to be a problem for you. Yeah. But things that, have an outsized impact on your diet, Uh, things like fresh greens, things like herbs, things that just like when you eat them, they they are either exceptionally good for your health or exceptionally good for your enjoyment and happiness as a human being. (laughs) Um, Those things can absolutely be compromised. And then things that are expensive can be compromised just because you're priced out of them. Things like really good fresh vegetables, fresh greens, cucumbers, tomatoes, herbs, like I said. Um, And so when you're approaching food security within capital within functioning capitalism maybe don't bother trying to grow potatoes because you can put in 20 hours of work to get a dollar's worth of potatoes out of your <laughs> garden yeah or you can put 20 hours worth of work to get $200 worth of salad greens and fresh herbs that make you really happy and could for some of us are probably one of the few fresh things we're going to eat all week yeah uh, like Learn to prioritize things that can that that will have an outsized impact within capitalism for the moment. Like, yeah, you should probably grow some staples just to know how and to have the seeds and stuff. But really, potatoes current, are really easy to grow. Yeah, potatoes <laughs> are really easy to get your hands on. And like, maybe focus on things that have an outsized impact on your mental health, your physical health, and your wallet because you need any every dollar you don't have to spend on food you can spend on bullets or (laughs) training or giving to a (laughs) or giving to a comrade in need or putting gas in your tank you know yeah for sure because that actually gas is one of these things that is ridiculous it's it's always going to be a limiting factor to us yeah yeah 
Yeah, and even the I work for a mid-sized dairy farm, and they're reacting very strongly to increases in gas and fuel prices, and so they're totally restructuring their farm right. to use less gas and to use less purchased grain. And that yeah, and everything <laughs> runs on diesel, which is even more expensive right now. Yeah, at, le- at least here, like uh, we measure our, our our fuel prices in liters, right? Mm-hmm. So it's right now we're at a dollar seventy four, I think it is, for a liter of gasoline, mm-hmm. and a do- like two dollars and nine cents for a liter of diesel. Yeah, <laughs> so it's pretty expensive. Yeah, and those things will have impacts on food, but they're going to have the biggest impacts on fresh food and meat things that require a lot of fuel inputs and a lot of uh, transportation and moving around. The government subsidizes so much of our grain and dairy production that you're not, you shouldn't grow, try to grow a bunch of wheat in your backyard (laughs) because you think there's going to be a shortage on wheat. Uh, The government's going to make sure you get your, your, your bread, bread and circus. Uh, But, but the fresh greens and the meats are sort of the thing that may end up being lacking. And so maybe those are the things we should focus on, uh, from, for food communities, food security in your community. Thinking about, uh, the conspiracy theory (laughs) angle, uh, (laughs) like that, that always makes me kind of like, what is the end game for the, the globalists? (laughs) Yeah. They just own every- us all up. (laughs) Yeah. They own everything, but they want to destabilize things. Like, right. If if they're, (laughs) if they're in charge, don't, Shouldn't they love everything exactly as it is? Like, I mean, they specifically need us consuming and working. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah literally the last thing—not uh, globalists, but the la- literally the last thing capitalists want—is for people to have to turn to subsistence farming. Like, yeah. the whole enclosure of the commons was—you know—there's an entire century of world history dedicated to stopping people from subsistence farming, right? To yeah. turn them into workers who bought stuff from them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The right-wing conspiracy machine <laughs> is something I I don't want to understand, first of all, but I will never understand it. It's yeah. the inconsistency. Well, I mean, those are the kinds of people that would benefit from maybe a little bit more theory. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> like I always, I do, I often get stuck on that, like, Okay, but your analysis is way off. Like you're just ignoring the yeah. fact that <laughs> capitalists want us working and buying. Like, yeah. Why why do they want things destabilized? Like hang, hang on, like <laughs> don't they own everything? At least it, uh, at least Alex Jones like he he uh incorporates Satan. So Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, that that queer Satan has a lizard <laughs> cabal that is behind everything. So that's like, right. they they at least want chaos, you know that. Okay, so that that's makes right. sense. Yeah. If you if you're working for the devil, then of course, yeah. whatever everything bad is good is a good idea. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, very funny stuff. Yeah, the I'm sure next week there's going to be a new right wing conspiracy to replace this one, and the week after that. But yeah, keeping there up always with them, is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I listen to quite a few like I listen to uh, the Q and On Anonymous uh, podcast. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, props to you. <laughs> <laughs> like someone's got to do it, but damn. <laughs> yeah. Like, so there's like, uh, there's lots of that right wing stuff. That's it's changing all the time. Yeah. There's no way to keep track of it actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's changing all the time, but if you dig deep enough, you'll find the anti-Semitism usually. <laughs> oh yeah. No, that, that's the core. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, they yeah. got to have the anti-Semitism. Yep. Even in their pro-Israel stance, it, they're yeah. anti-Semitic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. It, I, say, I was about to go on a tangent. I'm like, no, that's too, that's too far afield. Like, I can't start talking about evangelicals in Israel. That's a... Oh, yeah. No, that's a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. Like you were saying, even the, even the pro-Zionists somehow are anti-Semitic. And it's, it's a world... Like, those are the people that I'll never try to bring to our side. Yeah. Like, I'll just never spend a single ounce of effort going through that. And, you know, on the Rev Garden Facebook page, I kind of have to get a feeling for, oh, you're one of those, ban. Right, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I believe in counter-propaganda, and that's part of what organizing, that's a lot of what organizing in a rural area is, because there's not right. that many leftists to start with. But you got to learn some to draw the line somewhere. Like you can't yeah. counter propaganda fascist. <laughs> no, that's right. Like they're a, com- a committed fascist is not going to change their yeah. mind based on like facts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So 
It, once a person believes in white genocide, you're, they're pretty far gone. Yeah, like, if they end up coming around on their own, good for them, but I'm not going to spend this. I'm going to spend yeah. my time protecting the people they're trying to genocide rather exactly. than trying to cuddle up to them and make them feel better about themselves and come over to my side. Well, let's move on to foes and comrades. Yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we're, we're currently dunking on right wingers, but yeah. <laughs> let's also dunk on some patriotic socialists. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can argue about whether or not those people are actually left wing, but Ah uh, uh, yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you you told me the name of the 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 group in the conference that that I was referencing. Oh, um, I I lost it now. Are you, are you already forgot too? The party uh, for innovative politics or or something like that. I can't maybe, even... but but I guess we can just zoom out a little, and it's just the whole attempt among certain segments of the left to incorporate American patriotism with socialism and revolutionary politics. And I, it's hard to describe how <laughs> deeply misguided that is. Right. Like when you, when you dig down into what American patriotism is from the beginning, it's capitalists taking indigenous land and black lives and indigenous lives and using it to build ruthless capitalism at the expense of everything else. Like that's it. That that's American patriotism. And if you bring it to the modern day, it's American imperialism which was just yeah. an extension of the former, you know, and trying to connect that to any sort of truly revolutionary movement or any movement based on abolishing classes, abolishing capitalism is they're just two completely antithetical ideas. Like you can't incorporate them, <laughs> you know, like I, I don't know how much more clear I can make that. Like they're opposites. They're not, yeah. they're not two things you can bring together. It's, and, it's interesting because they're also often these people are also very apologetic of like uh governments that they consider left wing governments. Yeah. Which I mean, one can debate the merits of calling China a, a communist country. Yeah. But the commitment with which they defend everything that China has ever done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's it's remarkable to me that like that they also call themselves like they're so anti-American, but they call themselves American patriotic socialists. Yeah. They're it it's just it speaks to such an inconsistency in ideology that they're trying to pander to Americans with social with patriotism. Right. While just grabbing onto any country they can internationally to <laughs> use as some sort of guiding light. It it, the whole it's just so inconsistent and inconceivable and if you spend five minutes talking with a committed uh new african revolutionary or a committed indigenous revolutionary you would feel icky just trying to consider the idea of incorporating american patriotism right. with socialism because the most committed and the most well thought out revolutionaries i've ever met have been indigenous and black revolutionaries in america yeah. and trying to incorporate something that's so antithetical to their own struggle for liberation into your own struggle for liberation right. just feels like the deepest betrayal that you can imagine. It's, uh, I mean, I, I know a lot of people on the left, they, they, uh, they don't like wokeness or what have you. Right? Yeah. But it's white supremacy, right? Like, yeah. That's what, like, that's what we're talking like that's, about. That's what America is. <laughs> like, a, like America was built on taking land from, terrible natives because they don't deserve it and we deserve it more like how is that not white supremacy in every single aspect yeah, yeah, yeah. It... <laughs> uh, you can't yeah. be socialist and white supremacist you have you yeah. have to separate them. <laughs> yeah like you like i think that's a pretty clear line you can take and then if if you follow the formula okay you can't be socialist and white supremacist well you you can't be patriotic and not white supremacist like you can't be an american right. patriot and you know, oppose white supremacy. It's like, let's follow this chain of logic, guys. Like, okay, I can't, I can't be socialist and white supremacist. Can't be a patriot, but not white supremacist. Like, if I'm a socialist, oh. I can't be a patriot. Like, like, connect the dots here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's, and that's not to say that nationalism and patriotism cannot have a place in socialism. Like, new African patriotism, sure. indigenous patriotism. And, you know, if you black read, nationalism, yeah, if you read in, in in a colonized country, you know, read 
please, yeah. for the love of God, read France Fanon, any of you out here listening. <laughs> um, patriotism can be an incredibly powerful force for fighting colonization and then leading to socialism. Hmm. But America is the colonizer in most of these instances. Like yeah. the colonizer that patriotism is being used to fight in most of these instances is either America or France or England usually. Yeah. But yeah. see, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to clarify, like <laughs> patriotism can have a role in a revolutionary struggle, but just not patriotism for America or an inherently colonizer country. Yeah. Um, like, which I would almost include pretty much all of Europe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you can make some arguments for Ireland, maybe. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Like, that's right. Like, they're, they're more victimized. Of yeah. 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 But, but yeah, pretty much that's if it's a European country, you can bet that their, their patriotism is not particularly helpful to a revolutionary struggle. I always, whenever I think of Europe and colonization, I, I think of how many, like there's a bunch of, African countries that are still paying taxes to yeah. France. Yeah. Even though that they're technically not colonies of France anymore. Yeah. And it's it's like, I don't know. It's yeah. <laughs> absurd nonsense. <laughs> yeah. And then that's not even getting into things like the IMF and and um the World Bank, which force even more loans on the third yeah. world from the first world. And then in the United States, um I think there's some problems with fourth world theory, uh, which, you know, posits that indigenous and black populations in the United States represent a fourth world. Mm. But it's useful for thinking about some certain ideas because there are laws and uh, land use rules in the United States that specifically target black people and target indigenous people and still take money and resources and people from them. Like the yeah. foster care system in the United States still takes thousands of black and indigenous children away from their families and gives them to white families. So like yeah. the, this extractive process that America exerts on oppressed nationalities still happens. Like it's still happening every single day. And that's still something we have to fight against. And again, circles back to why you cannot have American patriotism and socialism <laughs> and any coherent system. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, those are our foes. What about uh, <laughs> what about comrades? Comrades. Uh, so I wanted to shout out the organization Crow, the Coalition of Revolutionaries and Organized Workers. Uh, I used to do some work with them. They are just some incredibly committed and incredibly active Black and Indigenous and Third World comrades operating within the United States. And I just cannot, They ha I have so much admiration for the way they structure their organization, for the um, actions that they take, for the political line, and for the ideology that they put forward, and the way they center Black and Indigenous liberation struggle within the United States. Um, they're still doing great work all over the country. I would posit anybody to take a look at them. Um, I don't think that they accept colonizers into their ranks. Fair. You know, like, <laughs> fair enough. Um, but you can, they'll still work with you. They'll still work with colonizer organizations. Like, it's not like a weird supremacy thing. Like, it's just right. having colonizers in their org has given them more trouble than help. But even if you are a colonizer, if there's a branch in your area, feel free to help them out. Or e even if you don't want to help them out, look at their organization, look at their charter, look at what they do and try to use that as inspiration for any action you're going to take. Because like, the four, the kinds of cadres that they're building, I think if every leftist in every city in America built a cadre like that, we would be doing a lot better. Instead of trying to find your perfect ideology that has maybe three people across the country that totally fits it, <laughs> right? maybe you find a group of people around you that you can agree on most things and actually work together and be loyal to one another and actually do things in the real world would be more effective. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's we have a lot of trouble on on the left especially the online left of like yeah. hyper hyper focusing on our differences yeah. instead of like just trying to work and do things that are beneficial to people yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i mean i'm a marxist you're an anarchist but we probably agree on 99 percent of things yeah. and if you you put us on the ground in any sort of action we would agree on what we ought to do and we would agree on how to do it for the most part and i think yeah. the community that's lacking in the left often it can can come back to a lot of this online sectarianism when 
or trying to find only comrades online. Like it's, it's easy to agree with somebody if you only ever talk to them over Skype and messenger, but maybe you should find <laughs> someone in your neighborhood. You can actually do real things with and f- form real loyalty and camaraderie with, and actually do yeah. real things in the real world. Um, and especially if any sort of disaster hit or any sort of real unrest hit, having a single comrade in your area who you trust will do you way more good than having a hundred followers online who agree with everything you say. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I guess the only thing left is where can people find your content? Yeah. Uh, so our Facebook page is having a little trouble <laughs> right now. Maybe follow it just in case I get it back. But if not, I'm going to be making a new one. Uh, the Revolutionaries Garden and the Revolutionaries Garden podcast. Uh, I also have a website, uh, therevgarden.com and a Patreon, patreon forward slash revgarden, uh, patreon.com forward slash revgarden. Um, I produce a podcast. Uh, right now we're bi-weekly, but we're working the gear up towards an episode every week. Nice. Uh, like we, Yeah, like I said, we have the really utility-based episodes, like this is how you grow carrot, this is how you can, this is how you dry food. Um, but we're also working on some bigger episodes. We're going to be doing some interviews about things like dumpster diving or communal living. Um, we're going to be putting out, as we build our communal farm, we're going to be putting out resources through the website, Rev Garden, about how we built it and the struggles we've had with that and how you might do it yourself or how you might come visit and actually help us with the communal farm and come live there. Uh, so yeah, RevGarden.com, Revolutionaries cool. Garden Podcast. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you chat. for your time. Yeah, this is, this is my first interview and I, I was glad to be here. <laughs> awesome. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a re- and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or RateMyPodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist Humanist Leftist Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves.